background of this is actually starting out around 2005, I started to organizing a uh, designing a class for Stanford. And you know, with that, right, I actually use years of my practices along with some of the things that I find useful and and started putting a class together. And you know, overwhelmingly, there's a lot of students that joining the classes and have, it has been every year a very popular class with, you know, large class sizes. And then, um, you know, I was encouraged to put those down and, you know, in, in writing a book about it. So uh, this year, so I have this book published and the concept that I put in is actually putting management by project mapping later when we go into details that you can see, and most of people probably know the concept of management by objectives. Uh, so essentially, essentially it's using project management as a tactic, not just for getting a service, getting a product done, uh, but it's a management philosophy. Okay, and that sets up the foundation for continuous innovation. All right, with that said, I'm not going to go to too much of the details in actually defining projects and things like that, right? So essentially, uh, for the works that we do, uh, uh, you know, in a typical company, uh, it will be high volume type of activities, operations, and then there will be projects. So projects essentially is a uh, zero to one process, right? You're getting something from zero and getting into one. And then the high volume manufacturing type of operations will be one to end process. So with that, right, um, the project is actually quite significant uh, for any typical companies because, you know, when you getting things done and typically the people that are working on projects are considered overhead uh, in, in companies because their salary actually is paid by people in operations. And any people that typically doing projects at that time, their salary is not earned by them, you know. So with that, right, company investing money and, and people in doing things that are not making money right now, of course, it's typical. It's going to be for the future of the company. So that's kind of setting up the foundation for you know what we do in, in, in as a project. So with that, uh, we will talk about a little bit about strategic planning. And when we talk about strategic planning, in my opinion, it's very simple. It's just setting out mapping projects. So any company should have a vision, and with the vision, it comes to setting the strategies to how to achieve that vision. And by setting strategy, a lot of times it means you know setting up the individual projects and mapping the projects together, and that makes up the strategy. So um, you can see the sentences here, projects are building blocks in the design and execution of strategy for enterprise to achieve its vision. So along with that, right, how you manage project becomes significant. Um, and again, um, during the last couple of decades, right, project management has been, you know, growing exponentially. Uh, with people that pay attention to it, companies started practicing it more and more, right? Uh, also, there's a lot of research going into that as well. So there's a several different type of project management tactics out there, traditional, agile, and extreme. All right, we'll touch a little bit about those and, and talk about those today. So now, in my opinion, right, what is the key focus? focus on, on doing project management. A lot of people will say, well, just get the things done, you know, finish the design of the products or, or, or process or a services and rolling them out to the market. Yeah, that's the case. But if we go back to the definition of our projects, essentially we're doing projects to ensure the company to have a future. So with that said, right, the project that we are doing, we're supposed to have innovation. So essentially, in my opinion, right, any project management, the overall objective and key focus, it's the innovation aspect of that. Because if you don't have innovation with projects, essentially you are just you don't have the competitive advantage, right? And then the company will don't will not have a good future. Now, uh, for us to do innovation, I, I think it's not just simply a slogan that you ask your employee to do. Uh, obviously, you have you have to set some foundations, and with that, I would say the foundation for achieving innovation is the capability lights on your company. Right, you need to get to certain capability to be able to do those things. Now, what its capability uh, uh, rely on? It's actually the culture of the company. If you don't have a good culture, you will not attract the people, the talent, and then 
those talent won't get developed into capabilities. So in my opinion, culture is you know kind of the next layer of that. Now, what is culture built up on? It's actually the system of the corporation. So essentially, it's, if you have a bureaucratic system, you won't have an open culture. So your culture is heavily depending on the system that you've built. So with this graph, it's quite simple, right? If we want to build innovation and we want to do you know, project management to achieve innovation constantly, we need to build, we really start a building from the corporate systems. And then we go to the corporate cultures, and then we get the capabilities, and then we achieve the innovation. Now, uh, innovation requires a lot of uh, effort, and you know, as everybody knows, right? There's a book that published, um, you know, uh, called it "Three Thousand Raw Ideas Equal to One Commercial Success." Um, so, as you can see here, right? There's a lot of ideas, and it gets into uh, projects and over here in the graph is showing 125 projects and then you get into uh, early development and then go into big developments and then go to the market and then eventually you have one success. Now if you're looking at that right now you know when I practice you know traditional project management and also agile right the current mainstream project management kind of focus on treating every project the same. So their method is try to get LV project to a successful ending. But if you're looking at that methodology and also looking at if a company using project success as a measure or a performance um, you know, uh, measurement criteria, if you think about it, right, if someone have a great idea on certain things and they want to start up a project, but the success rate is not high, and if the company are using project success as a measure, you know, those employees probably won't take the initiative to start those projects. And again, if you're looking at this graph, it's purely statistics, right? You try too many things and eventually you get to success. And the more you try, try right, the, the success you will get, uh, you know, a higher rate of success. So over here, if you look at this, right, we started out with 125 projects. In a company, do you need to have it at all 125 projects become successful? Um, the question is, may not, right? And and what we want to do is, you know, through the learnings and through the things, right? And some projects got eliminated and then were consolidated and then turned into different projects and eventually you lead to success, okay? So setting up projects, you know, and ensuring uh, using project management tactic in shooting everything is successful sometimes may not be necessary. Then that gets into, you know, in, in project management now, right? So do we not giving, you know, using all the tactics and things like that to ensure project will be successful or we just let the project go its, its own, right? So in terms of project management, in my opinion, first thing to do is actually to categorize projects. In any given company, right, you may have projects that you have to demand success. And in certain projects, well, it's okay. You guys go ahead, go ahead and try it, right? It's okay to fail, okay? So we'll talk about that. Now, before we go to that, right, we want to talk about a little bit about the innovation uh, uh, aspect of it. And from that, then we can see how we set up, you know, what we talk about the corporate system, the corporate culture, and the corporate capability to achieve that innovation. And then we link it back to the project management. Okay. So um, in the innovation, if you put that in the time scale and the performance scale, um, you know, if a customer kind of expecting certain products behave certain way, right? So that's the customer expectations. And if you are a company that want to produce a product that is being perceived as innovative, what you achieved has to be far exceeding the customer expectations. Okay? So your performance of the product that you introduce to the market, you have to exceed that customer expectation. Now, typically, when you do that, you get the customer's attention, right? Now, if you continue moving on, you know, when you gen initiate or, or, or introduce the second generation of products, you still need to exceed customer you know, uh, uh, expectations. And then in that point, customers saying, well, you know, your company actually has some good products. 
Now, you have to continue to do that every generation of product. And if you don't, typically the customer say, well, you know, you, you, you are, right? so there's a lot of companies and statistics shows that 95% of the companies are gone within five years after uh, starting, right? It's because some of the products that when they introduce, yes, it exceeds customer expectations, but then again, it below customer expectations and they no longer exist. Right. Now, if you continue on this journey for a while, then eventually you've got your customer's loyalty, and which there's a quite a bit of a company already achieved. Like, right? for example, take Apple, right? So now you can see here, right, the line that goes in here, the customer expectations continue to move up because the more you gave people, the more they expect out of you. And again, in LiveWise, right, it's, it's more so more difficult for you to keep up with that because, you know, again, right, it's more and more difficult for you to create a large gap between your product real performance and the customer expectations. So what does that mean, right? That means, you know, essentially it's getting more and more difficult to do consistent innovation, right? And then you need to take so many innovations to get to you know, uh, where to gain the customer's loyalty. Now, if you continue on this path, you will see eventually at some point, you will have products that are kind of below customer expectations because there's no way you can keep up with this trend, which is the case. If you look at most large corporations these days that exist for many years, right? Um, you know, they have, you know, below customer expectations. Now, that gets into the point that, you know, it's significant uh, for corporation to recognize if you already achieved customer loyalty, right? And, and this point becomes a, we call it infraction point, because now you could, you know, turn it around again, and then, you know, customer will say, yeah, you know, I know you still can do it, right? Or if you go down again below, right, typically the customer, it, it, it's gone. Right. So if you're looking at this, right, you actually can reset the customer's expectations. So you actually now you can see, right, you can ship the customer with a different slope, well, the expectation in a different slope. Even though your your next time around, you can, you 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 know still moving up uh, about the new slope, but below the the old trend, right, you're still being considered in, innovative. So now this is the thing, right? Again, most companies, when they first start up, if, if you take the first generation products, most startups, they want to invest all their effort to produce the greatest amount of you know, gaps between the product performance and the current customer expectation so they can get a lot of attention from the market. That's the case. But you have to make sure the future generation of product is there. And they also have to make sure you continue to ram at that pace, right? So it's not too many companies to plan this journey ahead of time. Typically, they just started doing it. And then when they, you know, get to a certain point and then they readjust it, okay? Now, who owns the expectation of the customers? A lot of times, once you are introduced into the market, you know, and that becomes your own portion of that. Because, you know, before you have first generation products, that's fine. You know, the customer have their own expectations of out of existing products. But once you introduce your, your, your product and exceeding the customer expectations, starting from that point on, you have contributed to the customer expectations. Okay. So with that said, right, it's, it's you know, the difficult question is, you know, how do you keep in the loop? Now, before we go to understand a little bit more about that, we talk about you know different models of um, innovation, right? First, it's the leader-led uh, uh, innovation, which is you know the, the leader have a vision that you know other people couldn't see, right? The cu customer and the market, you know, are, are not seeing, and then they execute it to that, and and then with that, right, you have achieving the results that's over the customer expectations. Now, this is often seen in startups because obviously um, typical startup leaders are focused on product development at the, at the first, right? And typically they're experts. Um, and this is, model is really difficult to maintain for the reason that you typically cannot depend on a single person to do everything. And also when a company first started, 
the leader might have a lot of effort putting into product development. But after a while, when the company is getting bigger and start to grow, uh, the leader typically have to, you know, take their effort in, for example, hiring, getting funding. So it's not too many people can go back and devote a lot of time into product development, right? And of course, so there are company that have tried to, you know, going back to the Apple example again, right? As Steve Jobs at the time, they actually, you know, he, he actually convinced the CEO of Pepsi to join him and help him to manage the company while he continued to focus on product development. Uh, but obviously, that strategy doesn't go too well for him, and eventually he got pushed out of his own company, right? Uh, now, there's also another thing that makes this difficult is typically when a leader has vision, when the company grows and they are hiring people, typically the leader will choose the people that can execute. Okay, so essentially it's this is how it goes. And if the leader is very confident that, hey, I have a vision, all I need to do is to have people that can help me to execute to it. So those people, we could call it the corporate machine. They are they're well run, you know. Uh, you know, if I ask them to run, they run faster than anybody else, and that's what the leader wants. Now, but the problem with that is if the leader, first generation leader step down and the company will facing an issue because suddenly the person that's setting vision is no longer in the company. And now if you are promoting the people that, you know, follow for the followers for this leader to run the company, obviously, you know, they can run, but now they don't have the vision. They lack the directions, right? Unless they learn through the process, uh, which is a lot of company they they didn't set out for 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 that type of training for their people because they want them to focus on execution, right? So you can see many many company get into that trap again too, right? Now, so this is typically how it goes. Um, you know, when you consider innovation, actually the key word in here is expectation. Now, if you have the second generation leader, as I mentioned, right, that is, you know, knows the, the, how the corporate runs and knows execution. Now they don't have vision. Typically, you know what they do is actually they go by a typical textbook answer, uh, which is the user uh, focus strategy. So you, essentially they say, hey, you know, I have customers that are paying me money. I just need to ask the customer what they want. Right, so essentially, you have a lot of companies that design their product by doing market research and just essentially asking, "Hey, customer, you know what do you want to see in our product? I'm going to give it to you." But the problem with that is, you actually don't get to being seen as innovative anymore because, you know, the customer is telling you what they want, and when you have a new product that comes out, right? They essentially just say, "Hey, you know, I know what you, you you're going to have because that's what I'm telling you to do." So by lacking that, you actually don't being perceived as innovative anymore. So that's another trap for that, right? So now, you know, take Apple as an example again, right? For the, you know, since Steve Jobs passed away with the latest iPhones and things like that, people can obviously see a lot of things that are coming out. You know, it's it's from what the market wants, right? And going back to Motorola, how they come you know, come up with the phone at those times, same thing, right? They and, and even Nokia, right? They develop their products based on you know market research, which is not necessarily a you know a, a right strategy if you really really want innovation because you want to surprise the customer, right? And that's how you exceed the expectations. Now. With that, I know, you know, depending on one person is difficult, right? So now the ideal way to do innovation is actually a corporate culture driven. Essentially, the project team achieve, you know, innovative results about everyone's expectations. That everyone expectation, including the market expectation, and also including the management expectation that it is set by, you know, the management staff. Okay, so now, a lot of people will say, well, that's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. True, because under the current uh, management uh, approaches and principles, a lot of times this is very difficult. Okay, so now, you know, there's a lot of company that are transitioning to this cultural driven innovation, right? Uh, when a company first started out and they decided to be doing it this way, for example, like Google, right? Google has, a, you know, typically have a good culture and, and 
you know, Google employee can feel free to start projects, forming teams on their own and doing all those kind of things, right? And then that's really need to, you know, surprises and, and exceed, you know, market expectations, right? So now, you know, before we go to talk about the detailed setup about, you know, uh, achieving this innovation, right? Achieving the cultural driven innovation. And, you know, I, in my opinion, right, if you get, want to get things done, not just innovation, it's, you know, you need to have the people that have the ability and also, uh, you know, they are willing to do it for you, right? So ability pass real, and then you can take that into, you know, achieving innovation. And that's the basic, you know, basic elements for it. Now, where does the real coming from? Essentially, it's coming from the culture of the corporation. Now, when you actually, you can translate this into a very, very micro level in a person. If you want to hire somebody, right, you want to hire that person that, you know, knowing the stuff, essentially is ability and also willing to work for you, right? So where the wheel coming from? A lot of times people looking at a people, person's resume, right? The resume only shows ability and typically the past ability, right? So that's why a lot of uh, managers uh, good managers, they're focused on hiring on behavioral interviews, right? Looking at cover letters. All those things are essentially finding out the view of this person. Why is this, this person want to work for me, right? Particularly work for this department, uh, you know? So that's the thing, right? The view typically is also, um, you know, for a person, it's out of the personality that we also need to look at, right? Now, in the corporate settings, that view is collectively you have, you know, certain set of things that, you know, governing the people's behavior. And that certain set of things is the culture. And that culture drives the view of that company, right? Now, where do we get ability? Obviously, it's from learning. Now, for you to learn, naturally, that also gets into the view. You know, people cannot learn stuff and master stuff, especially, and getting to advanced abilities without the will of doing it. So essentially, the will is very important, right? So essentially, just like going back to hiring as a manager, right? If I hire a person that has both ability and will, that's great. But if one is is lacking in one area, right, I prefer leaning prefer towards the will of that person. Right? Because if that person has a strong will, they will learn and we can teach them and then they will gain the ability. Now, as I go back, right, the will is coming from typically it's, it's you know, the work values and all those things is coming from a person's personality. And typically a personality is being set at a very young age before elementary, right? The study is already showing that. So as a manager, if I'm hiring somebody, you know, essentially I'm willing to invest to keep that person ability, but for me to change a person, uh, and that's the real of that, it's very really difficult, right? So that's why I'm leaning towards will. Now, with that said, right, you know, what is manager after you're hiring a person into your company, looking at the will? Essentially, the manager's duty is to maintain the work environment, making sure certain set of, you know, certain group of people, right? Are comfortable in working in those environments, and because if they feel that environment is not something that they would like to do, they will leave the company. So that goes with all the culture that they bring and everything else, right? Uh, so essentially, the environment, you know, it's very significant, and that environment is actually the corporate systems. So now you can actually going back to see, you know, the the early slides that I'm showing, right? Why is Corporate system is the foundation of a culture, and then culture is a foundation of a capability, and then capability is a foundation of innovation. Now, with that said, right, let's go to talk about the mainstream, you know, project management. So, essentially, for mainstream project management, is overly emphasized on processes and control. So, uh, if you're looking at the um, PMI's PEMBA. When they first introduced first edition of PMBOP, have 37 processes. In the last edition of PMBOP already grown the process into 49. That's a significant, significant growth, right? Because in management, right, they want to make sure they're doing things in a confident way. So they essentially they set out all these processes, and if it's something that you know 
that goes wrong, and they will naturally come in, hey, you know, let's just put up a system and put a process together to cope with it. And that's why you have making traditional project management and more and more complicated. Okay, and, and you know, in my opinion, right, in this day of information age, we want to execute things faster. Uh, we are trying to simplify project management processes, not making it more and more complicated. Okay, so now if you're looking at this, right, uh, um, Dr. Deming, uh, the person that introduced Lean and everything to Japan, right, have a very famous uh, quote saying, a best system will be the good person every time. So that shows you how important is a corporate system. And that corporate system, it's actually including all the policies and management tactics and everything that you use that bring bring to ask the people to do, right? That includes the you know the, the current mainstream project management systems, including traditional and also including agile. Agile also making a lot of things complicated and a lot of processes required for part you know roles and responsibility defined very well for project uh for, for scum masters, product owners, and all those things, right? So essentially, the idea is, hey, you know, I have an objective. Let's set that objective. And then I put up a guardrail, you know, along the line. So, you know, my employees can operate in with it in, right? And again, manage, managers typically are very vocal about telling the people that if, you know, the employees are reaching, you know, one side of the guardrail or the other side. Right, and if they do good work, and essentially, you know, they give them rewards, they get, you know, they pay them, and then if they didn't do well, you know, they started, you know, ask them to go to meetings and 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 tell them, you know, need to discipline them and doing other things, right? Now, this whole set of things, essentially, what we call is the policies and procedures create compliance compliance system. So if you want customer, uh, you know, you if you want employee to do things that are exceeding. Um, customer expectations, also your manager's expectations, obviously this system won't work, right? So now, you know, getting back to my, my you know, principle of management by project mapping, essentially the first thing I want to do is projects are actually, you can utilize them not just to achieve, you know, and getting a product out, getting a services design and things like that. You can actually use project to build an agile balance and open organizational system. Essentially, if you have a, you know, bureaucratic systems or a old traditional company that has been exist for many, many years, right? You want to go do something and want to encourage employees to innovate, right? The first thing you do is using project and mapping those projects into your company to you know, help your company to first change your organizational systems. And once your organization systems are changed to a certain point that people are comfortable with that and the people are, you know, then you're looking at certain set of cultures. And by the way, also you use projects and start up those projects to achieve those cultures. And then, of course, you can easily use projects and every project is like learning opportunity, right, to gain, you know, uh, capability. To, to you know to push the people with the you know challenging the people right so to do product management is not just simple as hey I have a product and we need to get to the market let's use project management uh, no project management it's actually a management tactic that can use to uh, change your design of your corporate systems and cultures and also uh, capabilities so now Here's, uh, you know, I have each slide showing some of the things there, um, you know. Now, most people that are doing project management already know large projects are being done in, in the metrics format. So you have a project organization with a project manager, and also you have functional managers, and then you pull people out of the functional organization, also reporting to the project manager, right? Now, we can use that, you know, methodology of metrics to increase, to, to, to get the flexibility of your organization and agile, you know, agility into your current systems if you don't have that, right? So essentially, you can start a project um, that, you know, naturally introduce new organizations into, you know, into your, your, your corporate uh, environment, right? And with that, right, people are kind of inter interrelated and, and through products and functions and things like that. And essentially, it will be have a more open environment. 
Now, again, there's a lot of other tactics that you can use, right? For example, why right now most companies are, are operating under the notion that, you know, the the love the more level the organization are, it's more effective and more more you know um, uh, decision making is faster and everything else, right? Now, the 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 more leveling of that organization is typically the problem with that is people have less chance to promote into the next level because you know so many people only have one manager and that manager didn't go somewhere else right and then you don't have opportunity for others now you can use projects to to cope with that because you you cannot have formal managers but you can have almost unlimited project managers and and you allow people to start their own projects and be their own project managers and if they made those things success right and made whenever they're doing success and become a new product they introduce to the market now naturally those people can become you know department managers and owning a team right? so essentially if you allow people to start a project on their own right in any corporations you know, people cannot come to you and complain that, oh, there's no, you know, career path to, to moving up, right? Because you can tell them, hey, you know, go start your project. And if your project being successful, obviously, you know, you can have your own department or, or managing your own product or whatever in, in the future, right? And during that process, you, you develop the leadership as well, right? So so that's something that you can heavily use project. Now, the given thing that I already talked about earlier, right? It's some of the project you have to make sure that, hey, it's okay to fail, right? And and in the Silicon Valley, the whole reason why we are actually, you know, being more innovative as compared to other areas, um, it's we are more willing to try and we are accepting failures uh, better in, uh, in other places, right? So now, same is likewise, right? And if you allow people to do projects and, and you know, focus on things that they, they like, right? And obviously, they have a strong will to get those done. And some of the projects, even, you know, they, when they first started, you don't give them enough resources and they will try to find resources on their own and, and you know, do their connections, do their, you know, experts that they, they know from and, and things like that, right, to get things done. Because if they know that when they finish those projects, they have a great success in their career path, right? And that's actually helping people to drive those wheels. And if you have a lot of people are, are doing that in the company, obviously a, a culture is a collective culture for the corporation, right? Everybody trying to do something like that then you will have a culture that everybody, you know, pushing upward and, and, and try the new things and try to exceed other people's expectations, right? And then you have an innovative culture, okay? So that's something that, you know, uh, going into that, right? Uh, now, of course, capability, that's actually a little bit even more easier because when you're looking at a corporation, right, if you want to get a certain a, a capabilities, you, you can and not just say, hey, you know, we're just going to study it or something. You have to do it, right? And and you do some projects, hey, you know, and, and it's a process of learning. And you may not get there, uh, you know, at, at the first project, right? Meaning you don't, you know, want to set that, hey, you know, this is the first project that you try and I want this first project to be successful. Uh, but eventually you ask them, hey, what do you learn from it? And what do you, you know, get from it, right? And eventually you will get to the capability that you want to get, right? And, and for that, right? People, it's very seldom that people learn something and then they just set it aside. Because if you give some skill sets to certain people and they want to practice it, and essentially that's where you, you know, initiate projects for creating capabilities. All right. Now, that gets into uh, the project mapping side of things. Okay, so essentially this is the concept of project management by, uh, management by project mapping. So, as I mentioned before, right, we need to separate projects in the corporation. You know, certain projects need to be successful and certain projects it's okay to, to, to fail, right? So now I'm putting the projects into these three groups. So the first group at the very far end, right? And, and again, we put this in the two uh, axis. One is time axis as time move forward, right? And you're looking at how in the future, right? And then the other one is the learning uh, axis, okay? So the learning asset is the one that closest to the innovation and my model there, right? So now you actually need to map those projects and the projects are the circles in, in this in this graph here, right? The bigger circle means bigger projects. You're putting more resources in and smaller circles means smaller projects. 
So for the very far to the left, those what I call pathfinding projects, and that's experimental oriented. Okay, so for a company that actually aligns with the company's vision and mission, because that's long term, right? But for you to have that vision, you cannot just say, oh, let me finish what we do right now and then we'll see what we do when we have time, we'll get to that, right? And at this time already, you have to experiment in things that related to your vision, right? And that's in the future. And mission is, is a purpose statement. Essentially, those two are the strategic means and typically oh, we group them together. So you have to do, you know, quite a bit of those projects, okay? Now, those projects, you don't need to be, you know, getting all those projects at, to the successful end. It's okay to, and again, you have to evaluate them, you know, frequently, regularly, and then, you know, you determine what to do with them, right? Now, the middle section is a core project. So core projects, you cannot do too many because that's where your next generation of product that you're going to introduce to your market. And that's going to be things that's sustaining your company for the next revenue, um, for the next cash cow. So you cannot do too much. You have to be focused. And those projects, you know, you actually have to make them successful. And you have to really set very clear objectives, okay, to get those done, right? Now, that the really left side of those projects, again, we're getting into smaller projects now. And those are what we call a continuous improvement focus projects. So with those projects, essentially, you, you, it's, you, you're refining your process, you're refining what you've done in the core projects, and also try to promote those core projects into you know, different market segments, for example, you know, capture additional values for you, right? And those are the things that is there. But more importantly, actually, you know, it serves as another um, in here is the cultural aspect of a company. If you think about it, right, typical large companies, they actually set out to have the research labs to do the pathfinding projects. Uh, so essentially, you have all these famous labs like Bell Lab, you know, at the Park, and then uh, HP Lab, Intel Labs, Google X, right? Uh, Facebook Creative Labs, right? And then you also have product development groups, right? Those are people that are doing the core projects. Now, what are the regular employees doing? In a typical company, right? Rather than company, the like IDEO doing project for others, right? Your first line people, it's actually more than your research people and more than your development people, product development people. If those people don't participate in doing projects, you don't have a corporate culture that is innovated and everybody try to exceed everybody's expectation, that type of thing. Okay. So essentially, the continuous improvement project in the corporate settings serving as a means to encourage everybody. Essentially, you challenge every employees in the corporation. Hey, can you do something faster? Can you do something that is beyond the expectation of people that are accept, um, accepting whatever you do as a receiver, right? Uh, you know, just because you have created a whole value chain all the way, you know, to the customers, right? So essentially, if you look at those things, you can see there's a quite a few companies that are doing really well in those cases. And, you know, they are not only, you know, the corporate culture is not only set by the the product people, the research people, and for example, I'm going back to Google again, it's a good culture, right? And the Google, you know, if you go and look at the Google site, you go visit them, right? The environment is changing, and a lot of environmental studies that are being introduced to it, essentially, is the people that are maintaining the building, that are taking the initiative to make sure the environment is actually, you know, exceeding the employees expectations, right? And then when everybody does that, right? Like, you know, if we Google HR, they come up with other things, right? So that surprise other people. If everybody in the company to do something that's surprising other people, it's essentially, if you are a product engineer, you look at, hey, the people around you, right? And the administrative assistants and, and, and the, the building maintenance people, the HR, everybody try to go out their way to try to something new, right? Doing some project in addition to what they are asking to do in the job duties, right? Then they will do something beyond expectation as well. That's just the culture. That's the culture essentially is like a peer pressure, you know, push people to do things and because that's acceptable um, by a group of people, right? So now you can see how this setup is. Now, uh, if I give you a little bit better 
Kuang Bahai, I, I developed this model. Essentially, is one of my functions in Intel is also a career advisor. So two career advisors, and this is the model that we've been using for guiding a person uh, to achieve their career advancement. So essentially, you have two axes here, right? The, the time scale is quite simple. You can just ask the, the, the person, hey, you know, you want to be successful in your career. Hey, what is your vision? And, and you know, what year from now you will see yourself at the peak of your career? And what is that vision looks like to you? So essentially, you already define the timing. And also, you're already defining the, the, the vision, right? Now, once you define that vision, let's say, for example, if an engineer right now wants to become a general manager, obviously, now we will say, hey, you know, you have that vision, but now let's look at the learning scale. Now, your core competency is the engineering, you know, te technical side of things. Now, we can map out the learning scale, learning access, right, to achieve all those things that lining up step by step to you know, if you want to be a general manager, right? Those are things that you need to line up to your vision, right? So now you kind of already defining those two axes. Now you can put the project according to those and what time I think I need to correlate those. And now you can kind of define what's pathfinding projects. Now, what is core project in an individual career development? It's actually the things that you do to get to your next position, right? So why now you have your own position? What is your next position? Okay, so that you need to in, invest the most effort to achieve that, right? And hopefully, you need to be successful and that to go to the next position before you, you know, find out your vision, right? So essentially, this pans out for the individual. Now, it gets into, you know, what is the continuous improvement uh, uh, projects there for individuals? You know, when we do the career advisor sessions, most of the uh, the people that come to us, they're saying that, yeah, great, you asked us to do this, you know, pathfinding court and stuff, but I'm very busy with my current job. You know, I'm, I'm doing overtime and doing all this stuff. My question to them is, hey, if you are taking all your time to doing your job right now, that means you just barely qualify for, for your existing job. What you need to do is figure out and learning the scale, skills to be able to be efficiently doing your current job. So your goal is, for example, you take six days to do your current job, okay? Next quarter, I would like you to go down to five days and you can do your current job and your boss will still be happy about it, right? And then we set another objective for the next quarter to go down to four days. Now you will have an extra day to do some other projects, right? Otherwise, you will never be progressed in your path. So likewise, right? So those are the continuous improvement projects for. It's the skill set that you need for your current position to be able to sustain and, and be able to, you know, you, uh, generate additional time and resources for the others, okay? Now, by looking at this map, right, you can actually see that, hey, you know, there's a few projects in the middle and there's a lot of projects and the pathfinding, there's a, quite a bit of projects also in traditional, uh, on, the, on the continual process. Now, in terms of using project management tactics, why now I think that there's three main uh, a group of project uh, management approaches, right? There's a traditional management, uh, project management, which means, you know, I, would def I set the plan out and then I'll just go execute those, those plans. So it's, it's a plan to work, work the plan, right? And you also have the agile portion of it, which I, in my belief is very well fits the core projects. Um, and then also there's an extreme project management that currently is not defined too well, but it's very really good for the pathfinding projects, right? And for those of you that, you know, not sure the, the uh, history of those three tactics, right? Traditional project management is, is developed mostly in the early days, you know, in the, by the, uh, the, the related, right? Defense projects and all those things. And then later on, you know, um, when we have the internet and that's the, the you know, the mid nineties and things like that, uh, where extreme projects, uh, extreme programming and all those things started to come out because at those times, especially in the Silicon Valley, you just don't have time to pan. You know, when you finish a throw pan and people already execute to it and you're already too late to the market, right? So at that point on, you know, we come up with the face and, and, and you know, just do it, right? And and like he actually caught on with those time fame and, and, and making that statement very well, you know, set, right? So now that, but if you're just doing it, again, it doesn't go too well, you know, that, you know, in 
my opinion, large portion of it leading to the dot com bust, right? Because you it's very inefficient if you don't do any pain, you just go do it, right? So now agile is actually kind of hybrid between the extreme and traditional. Okay, and start of getting more and more people use it after the year two thousand, right? And start to, to getting become mainstream, especially in software development with the scum and all those processes, right? So and, and that's I think it's pretty good for you know, for core projects. Okay. Now this model you can actually set it out and if you can see here, right? If I separate this into, you know, six regions, you can actually use this to analyze any particular company. And if you know the company well enough, right? So essentially you take a a, a, a given company looking at what they are doing right now, what are the projects that they're doing right now, and you can actually put the circles into this map, right? Now, if you put project on, if you have project on the, the far left region, right, that goes to the region, essentially is three and six, right? You are okay, right? If you don't have those projects, which means you only have projects for your next product generation, and you haven't think about the future. And the the projects in six, it's actually creating options for you. And that's why going back to this, right? I put that as like a funnel on the top. Essentially, it's the more you do on the past finding, the more options you will have for the future generation of core projects as the time moving forward. So you either combine some of the past finding projects or, or, or making certain a, um, past finding projects larger to become core projects for the future, right? But if you don't have projects on six, right, then your company's future will not be too bright because you run out of options after your next generation of products. Now, I still won't, wouldn't recommend people to put projects on number three because those require skill sets are pretty low. And with that pretty low, that means when you introduce introduce those products out there, obviously the competitive advantage is not too high and you have to force to rely on marketing and all the other strategy uh, to, to make up for it, right? So the preferred projects, it's actually on region six. Now getting into a middle section, we, you know, region two and five. Now, if you have project in two, that's actually a prefer because for those projects, we want successful, you know, uh, uh, to finish those projects because that's the next generation of products to the market. And we need to get that out and we need to get that out quick. Now, if you use doing that in five, a lot of time that means it's required advanced capability that either your company is not quite master well or the technology is not quite mature. Essentially, if you have a lot of projects in five, you will delay you will experience delay of the project. Why? Because those projects are actually belong to six. If you think about think about that, right? So you you actually would prefer to do it a uh, large scale of projects, not too many, because you need to focus on resources. And by the way, the cross pining project projects are like uh, express train for your company. When they come in, LV train yields. Right, so those are the things that every company should know. Hey, what is core project for my company? And when those company comes in, all the support people, right, purchasing, legal, HR, whatever, those people, you know, they have to put down and whatever they do to support those projects first, because you, we want those projects to be done quickly, right? So, so that's you know putting a number two. And again, there's a lot of company that they're doing things, events, they're doing too many core projects and leading up. Your lack of resources and, 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 and then eventually ended up failing. Okay, so like for example, in a Chinese company called uh, Le Si, it's, it's exactly in my opinion, that's how they failed. Okay, now that goes into, you know, the far left, uh, the left region one and four. Now, naturally, because you want people, everybody, this is for every employee, you challenge everybody in their own position to do something that is, you know, and to take on project that improve their own you know, processes and, and their own uh, uh, jobs, right? So with that said, it's naturally those they will actually see to use the existing skill set that they walk close to their court, you know, so essentially it's most likely it's gonna be in one, right? Now what happens if certain employees are actually doing things in four, 
right? First line employee is actually doing something in four. Well, you don't want to put them down. You actually want to encourage them. And what you do as a management is to actually provide them the link to the research groups that are doing projects in six. Because again, like Steve Jobs said, right? I guess one quote that Steve Jobs has is, you know, the people that are crazy enough to think that they change the world are the people that actually, you know, eventually did, right? So, um, so if people that are actually out of, you know, uh, things right like like Intel actually we have one person in Arizona a factory worker actually working in their garage to do a space shuttle right so those are the things that you know some people are crazy you know to do it and you actually need to you know kind of use those projects and link those projects to the research labs and link it to the six and try to use Use more resources to helping those people, and eventually probably moving those people to to the research side of things as well, right? So now out of this painting, you can actually analyzing a a corporation in terms of how they met the project. So this is essentially the whole concept that I'm talking about here, um, you know, in, in in doing this, right? Now uh, I here I have a you know characteristic of the projects, in, you know, essentially. Uh, first thing to do is looking in within your companies and making sure you have projects in all three areas. And again, looking at what the focuses are and, and you know, the timelines here, the target and everything else is already lined up with what, what I talked about uh, before. So uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about, you know, each, each boxes here. Um, now, you know, once you map this, this again is a strategic level, right? So once you have that, now we transition into technical project management. So why now technical project management, of course, traditional project management and agile and, and, and all those things, right? So uh, as I mentioned, right, the process is getting more and more complicated because every time people seeing something that is, you know, is inefficient, they put an additional process to manage it. So in my opinion, project management needs to be simplified. It's quite simple, you know, if you look at this here, right? So we, we kind of keeping the project life cycle, right? From initiation to definition, to execution, to implementation, and then we get results. And previously, people were focused on perform, per performance. And I also want to focus on learning as well, okay? Now, out of understanding all that in the time scale, the first thing we have to do is set up the infrastructure for people. Right, and people is the most important thing for projects, and that's where innovation coming from. So, with that said, it's essentially just what I went through from you know the setting up the corporate system, and then getting the corporate system to to you know suitable for a certain culture that you want to keep, right? And then the culture has to be promoting the capability of that, and then you achieve innovation, right? With that at Actually, that's the entire over um, the, over the entire life project life cycle. We have to focus, right? Now, the next level on that is actually managing information, because project, after all, it's you know getting a, in ideas, right? And how do you initiate those ideas? And after the ideas initiate, how do you share them, right? After you sharing them, then you decide which one to go for, and then you take actions. And but you know, you doesn't end with just finishing actions. You do retrospective to 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 see what did we learn from it, and is there anything we can do better, right? So essentially, you have a whole flow of managing information at the next level. And then after that, now. You know, when you finish the initiation phase, right, you essentially go to the definition, you essentially you're doing project plans, you're actually planning the activities. Now it's how do you manage the tests? And when you manage the tests, in my opinion, actually, uh, you know, initiate a new method. Uh, most people doing traditional project management and SCUM and everything knows a typical method to do is actually a work breakdown structure. And I introduced a new concept called work build up structure that actually changes that and, and you know, um, we, we don't have time here, but we can get into more details. And also later on, if you get, uh, I will show you the, the um, organization of my book, then you can see what those things are, okay? And then after we do that, we make sure the sequence of the tests, um, what needs to be done, what needs, and again, traditional project management focus on all the network diagrams and all those things. And it's actually don't need to be that complicated. 
Okay, and then after that, we assign ownerships, and then we manage the risk to that. Right? assign risk to, to associate items. And then the next one is doing the schedule. You know, determine the direction and then do the scheduling. And also here I introduced the critical train scheduling, which is not based on deadline. Okay. And based on that, it's actually using the cultural perspective of things uh, to pushing people to do things faster. Uh, so that's actually my overall project management models. Now that goes into the book that I am actually putting out here. Okay, so like I mentioned, right, I started out this book, you know, uh, uh, starting out teaching in Stanford of 2015 and then, you know, uh, slowly, right, and also a lot of students actually contributing to this and, and help me to, to, you know, refine this process. So the textbook has 10 main chapters and, and you can see there's two graphs that actually kind of showing you what those are. Okay, the first chapter we specifically talk about innovation and define what that is. And then the next one we talk about project management and essentially we talk about the project management life cycle. Uh, we talk about the different project management processes out there that, that uh, are the approaches that people are using. Right? And then the next one we talk about strategic planning, essentially it's just mapping projects. It's the top graph that I'm, I'm showing there, right? Mapping project into you know, the pathfinding, the core project, the continuous improvement projects. And then the next one moving into people. How do you set up, how do you make sure your corporate system, you know, it's there and um, what kind of culture you want, right? And the capability, and then eventually get to innovation. So that's the people in chapter four. And then in chapter five, we talk about, you know, information and we introduce tools, to how, to, how to generate ideas in addition to brainstorming and introduce, you know, bring writing, bring swarming, certain tools, right? And also introduce new tools for collaboration, decisions, and all those things um, that I find useful, that I practiced uh, and, and, and seeing good results, right? And then the next one is test, how to do the, um, you know, work build up structure and things like that. And then um, uh, chapter seven is how to manage the time. <coughs> Now, the last three chapters are specifically to managing different type of projects. So chapter A is about how do you manage pathfinding projects? And number nine is how do you manage you know, the core projects? And number 10 is how do you manage the continuous improvement projects? Now, the, when I do this book, right, I also put a little bit of innovation into this book. Essentially, every chapter that I put in this book have four sections. And there's a T section, there's an M section, and there's an L section. You can call this top level, medium level, and low level. Essentially, each section is, is saying, uh, you know, like top section is, hey, what is the concept that I'm introduced? And then M section is provide you some of the reasons and explanations. And then the L session is tell you how to do it. So essentially for the people, because I do understand there's so many different audience here, and then some of the audience are focused on strategic planning. So maybe all they need to know is the, the, the reading the concept. So in that case, you can actually read this book, not going through chapter by chapter, but instead you can go through session by session. So you finish the T section in chapter one, you can go to the T section in chapter two, and then you go to T section in chapter three. And that's pretty quickly, you finish the whole book, right? Now, if you want to understand a little bit of the logic, why I'm t saying this, right, that, then you go to the M section, right? And for those people that are more technical, that, hey, I don't need to execute, right? Then, okay, then you can read the L sections. So essentially, if, you know, this book actually is available in Amazon and, and all the uh, places, Barnes & Noble, and the website. So I do recommend you to buy the painted book. Uh, the whole book is over 300 uh, pages, it's all in color, um, and, and each section, I actually color code each session, so it's easy for you to look at the color code and then go through the sections. And the reason why you're buying an ebook, it's okay, but the ebook, you can only jump from chapter to chapter, you cannot jump from session to session. And also when you're doing the ebooks, when you just go that the screens and they don't have the color code that with each section, so it's really difficult for you to uh, uh, using that method there. Okay, so so essentially that's how you know the book is being set up to do. Okay, now um, here I think you know that so the, I supposed to stop in in around you know ten fifteen, but I'm taking some of the uh, things that to uh, show as examples and and some of the things. And the first thing that I want to show is 
the differences that the methods that I introduced, uh, the work build up structure compared to the work breakdown structure. So, um, so essentially, if you think about traditional project management, right, you start up with a project and then you begin down the sub components and then you continue to break down the sub components. So, you know, taking a, you know, building a house as a project, for example, right? So you continue to break it down. Now, notice that this is actually really difficult for people to consider innovation into the project. Essentially, every level that you define, you can only think of, you know, underneath those things, right? And then also, if you go to your team and asking, hey, you know, we want to build innovation into this uh, project, well, People that might say, "Hey, I'm 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 only doing the concrete. You know, how can I do? I in a way, I have no idea. I'm just not participate. I don't care, right? So again, when you when you ask the team to, you know, when I teach the class, right, I ask the team to do, you know, in a, as an in class exercise, right, start doing the work breakdown structure, and they feel that this is really, you know, tactical and in a sense a little bit of a boring because they just say, "Hey, I need to do this, and let's figure out what this make up of, right?" So it's just a process to go through. Right? Now, this is essentially a top-down approach. And def once your scope defined in the next level, defined, you can only go down to the next level, right? People typically, is confining people. People don't think outside of the box. So what I'm introducing here is another way of doing things. Instead of doing the, the, the uh, breakdown, we are doing a build-up structure. So you essentially ask, hey, what are the bare minimum fundamental things that we have to do for this project, right? And then after that, what, what else do we need to do? And you build up one layer at the time up to the point that you know, okay, when I get to that point and if I stop and, and call that the project is done, the customer actually is willing to pay for it, okay? Now that you know, that's where the customer and market expectation line is, right? So essentially, everything below that, you go with the traditional project risk management, right? And then you contain the risk. Now, about the line is something that you need to figure out. And those are the things that you need to keep confidential. Don't leak it to the market and don't give it to the, don't tell the customer. Because once you tell them, it will become part of the expectation. Those are the things that you are trying to offering surprises. So essentially, this is kind of how it goes, right? When you build a house for certain people, you know, hey, the person say, hey, you finished all the rooms, finished all these things. Yeah, I, I, I got the key and then, you know, you pay me the money. Now, in merchant, if a customer goes in the house and suddenly they see something that they didn't see before and, 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 and they don't expect, wow, they say, hey, you know, that's really worthwhile that I'm paying for it. And they are not just willing to pull up the paycheck, they're paying with a smile and they will tell their friends and their, their families and everybody. And that's where the innovation comes from, right? So essentially you keep those things quiet. Now, again, this same model I use is also initiative at the time that when I doing uh, career uh, advising, right? Essentially it's the same thing, you know, for any given employee, uh, employee right? You can actually map out the things that your boss expect you to do. But if you're only doing what your boss expected out of you, you're not going to get to the next level of promotions and things like that. And you have to do something extra. And that's something extra. Hopefully, you need to keep it confidential, you know, and, and, and make it a surprise, right? Now, again, those things, you don't need to be too many of those things. And when I do the exercise in class, people are doing this and they see that everybody's smiling. There's fun. Actually, it's a fun exercise to come up with something that people don't expect. And if you're not believe me, you can, you know, grab a group of people and you can go to the same exercise, just like using a building a house. Then, you know, people will actually think about, hey, you know, if I'm building the house first, right, I have a vision. What is this house is for? Is it for the for the people that retire or is it for the for the young, you know, technical high end people? Right. Once they have that, they will think out a way that, hey, you know, how how can I surprise them when they get the key? And when they people talk about it and talk about it, they actually create a lot of energy. So the process is no longer like the traditional project work breakdown. It's become like a, a schematic type of exercise. OK. 
So, so again, this is building up to the vision. So, I and, and in in the chapter in my book, actually, I specifically guide. And again, it's using post-its. You know, you define the functions and features, and through that, you divide the and you know define the tasks that you need to do. So, it's a whole process in the book that guiding people to use this this whole uh, new concept there called build, what build up structure, right? And again, if you use the shows it's still WBS, right? So to to make it different, I kind of put a U in between. So that's why I call it uh, what build up structure. Right now, again, if you talk about risk management, again, traditional project management is is uh, risk management is is essentially what I call risk containment. And if you're going back here, right? So essentially, they map projects risks based on the impacts and the probabilities. So what you're managing risks essentially very simple. It just reduce the probability and reduce the impact. All right. But if you want to reduce probability reduce impact a lot of times you say hey i'm not going to be creative i'm not going to do something and that's you know be conservative right then you reduce the probability but if you don't do that you know where is your where is your 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 risk you know uh, where is your innovation coming from right so essentially here you know for keeping the things on the top of the line confidential you create a psychological safe environment for your team to do things because you know, out of those three, maybe one or two doesn't get out, uh, uh, doesn't doesn't materialize. It's still okay because the customer doesn't know it, right? Nobody knows outside the team. So essentially, everybody if you say try something, it doesn't work out. It's fine, right? So now the new model again I introduce here, you know, to manage the risk is essentially it's no longer just you know the risk containment on the bottom like the traditional project management, right? It'd be about the customer expect line, obviously you can see, right? The scale there, I have a degree of surprise, right? So, you know, probability, you have creativity because the more creative you get, and maybe there's a chance that you have a probability of failing, right? But again, you can actually put up with this kind of matrices and then the impact actually correlate to the opportunity that you create. The bigger the opportunity that you create, the more risk you want to take, right? The more in impact, you know, you're willing to live with, right? So essentially, you can actually put in scores for each one of those, pop the docs for each, each activities or functions into this, and then, from that point on, you can choose what to do and prioritize those things, right? So that's another uh, way of managing uh, risk. Okay. So now, on, on the next four minutes or so, I'm going to introduce a little bit about the uh, scheduling of things, right? So instead of traditional scheduling, everything is focused on deadlines, right? Uh, we want to actually, you know, initiate a different type of scheduling and which is called critical chain scheduling. Uh, and this, you know, again, you can use building house as a, a mean to, you know, doing the exercise. So people typically define the uh, schedule as a game chart and then every game chart ends with a deadline and things like that. You have milestones, you know, on the projects and all the, those things, right? Now, again, you know, the due dates actually introduce a lot of be behaviors for people. And, and the student syndrome you can see here. And then also, you know, Parkinson's law, once you define something, the work expense to fill the, the allocating uh, time slot. And then also when people giving you the times, they do padding and then also people fit, fitting in multitasking and all those other things into this, okay? So in my book, you know, it spells out all this, you know, problems with traditional scheduling. And now, going into critical train scheduling, right? Critical train project management was introduced, you know, in the mid 90s. Uh, but still, I wouldn't say, you know, it, it caught on too quick, uh, um, you know, not widely accepted and, and in practice. It's because the issues um, in, in lies on how to manage it, how to do the, the, the scheduling itself. Uh, so, you know, essentially the concept is putting the test out and then putting a buffer at the end. But by just doing this, a lot of people don't like it, especially, you know, employees seeing manager doing that. They just say, hey, you know, you just want to push us to do things quicker and create it safer at the end. But it's not just that simple. And if, you know, in terms of any schedule, when you develop the schedule, schedule is just something on the paper. It's how you track it, how you manage it that counts. So my whole concept of uh, rounding the, the critical change scheduling, it's mostly on the how you managing it. Because, you know, when you're managing that, like here is a, a quick example of, you know, how you manage the critical change scheduling. The top one is traditional project, 
management. So if one thing delays on a critical chain, everything delayed, you have to push out the timeline, right? Now in critical chain scheduling, one thing delayed, what you do is you ship the test out and what you do is you keep track of the buffer consumptions. And once you keep track of the buffer assumptions, you can actually allow you to make accountable for each individual. Okay. And, and, and that's something that, you know, I don't have time to go into too much detail, uh, but those are the things that you are know, very really well and how you should use this method and how you manage it. And here's an example of a development with two chains of command. And again, uh, this is an example of how you do the uh, critical chain scheduling type of things. And once you finish, how do you you know do calculations and keep track of a buffer? And then eventually, how do you manage individuals? And then looking at what are the percentage that they use their consumptions. And with that, you can actually measure individual performance and individual test performance. Instead of in the old days, one person delay and everybody delay, and it's very difficult for you to hold somebody accountable for something. Right. Uh, and then you can also keep track of the whole buffer and everything else, you know, in, in, in the, uh, uh, at the overall project uh, progress. Okay. Now, um, also giving um, you a little bit more. Just a second, Dr. Yes. Frank, I think uh, Richard had a question. Uh, Richard, if you can go ahead and ask. Yeah, I have one more minute and I want to go to these three slides and then, you know, we'll open up everybody for questions. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the last one, just to show you a quickly about, you know, remember the last three chapter that I put in is specifically how to manage pathfinding projects, core projects, and also uh, continuous improvement projects. So this is the model that I'm using for managing pathfinding uh, projects. I call it a 6P model. So you focus on passion and purpose. From that, you define the both projects and prioritize those projects. And then when you do it, you have to do it with patience and persistence, and then how you manage performance. Also, proliferation of knowledge is important. Uh, so those are the 6P uh, dimensions. And I will also actually separate, they further define the uh, pathfinding project into three different areas. So some projects for, for strengthen mission and some projects for capability and some projects are creating options. Uh, so with that and different type of projects also have different type of management tactics and how do you measure success? Because obviously we cannot use the successful uh, ending for every project to, to, to see successful or not, right? So um, from that point on and guiding everybody how to do the projects in each areas. And then also every chapter, the last three chapter, I have a checklist for people to, you know, check on how they set up to manage those projects. All right, so that's actually all I have um, to say in here. So and now I'm opening for our questions. Richard, I have unmuted you. You can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. I'm sorry. My phone was on mute as well. Uh, I was going to say, in, in your example of home construction, you, you break down the boundaries of the different domains uh, mm -hmm. so, that, you know, uh, so that the different stakeholders can innovate across them. Uh, but home construction is typically performed by multiple different uh, specialized companies, uh, which you're subcontracting to. Um, and that might be reflected in IT, for example, if you're um, uh, contracting with another company to manage your data centers, or perhaps you contract with a, a different company to do uh, certain software development and so forth. How does your framework accommodate this model? So essentially, it's it's when we're doing this, right, the first thing you need to look at is the overall. You know, what are the things that, you know, you want to surprise customer for, right? And obviously, you have a management office that's doing this, and then you kind of, you know, highlighting what needs to be done, and then you subcontract those out. Now, below the, the, the customer and marketing expectation line, those are actually not too much different compared to traditional project management. Those things you need to be successful. If you don't successful, the customer won't pay for it, right? So essentially this model tells you that yes, we want innovation, but innovation does not necessarily mean 
you know, everybody have to do, a, you know, to, to, to innovate, right? For example, the people that are doing the, the, the country, right. Right? there's no point oh. for innovation, right? Any, did I answer your question correctly? Right. Your first thing is to to you know look at it from the project level, and then of course then you contracting those people out, right? And defining what you do, uh, you know the, the the acceptance criteria for those people, and, and and depends on the test that they do, right? Some some of them are have to be you know meeting the customer expectations, so there's not much deviation out of those things. They have to do it the way uh, per pen, right? And things that are about you kind of keep track of it and ask people to do, which you know uh, you can have more room to pay with. Okay. Hello. Uh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Hi, um, I have a question. When you talked yes. about the key ingredients for innovation, you spoke about mm -hmm. learning, ability, will, and innovation. So of all of those, you, and also the culture and the environment, which one is the most important, you think, especially for a young person starting out? Well, like I say, right, the foundation is the corporate environment. Because these days, right, people only want to work for a company that they, you know, they feel confidence for it. Like, example, in, in, in my book, actually, it's spelled out like this, right? The reason why a lot of companies nowadays, like right, Google and things like that, you know, they, they put, you know, in their corporations using art as the decorations and also allow games and all those things in the company. Essentially, it's they create an environment to attract certain type of people. And again, the artist people, for example, right, they, they have creative genes in them, right? So it would be ideal for Google to hire programmers that also, you know, learn art when they're young and everything else, right? Because they have the creativity uh, kind of things there. And for, as an artist, right, a lot of things that you do, you're, you're going for mastery and you are not going for monetary rewards, just like, you know, you're paying a guitar, paying a piano or draw, making paintings and stuff like that. You're not going to make much money out of it, but you're doing it out of the enjoyment and happy, right? So those are the people that we want to, you know, incorporate into the corporation. But if you think about it, if you are artists going into a company that like a traditional company, the carpet is gray, the wall is white, do you feel as an artist, they are confident about that, right? So there's a statistic show that about 62% of the employees joining a company within the first month, they already determined that if this company they want to continue as they are in a long-term career uh, uh, in that company. So essentially, you know, within a month, you cannot even see a corporate culture or understand the total culture of it. Essentially, it's like, for example, I'm an artist, I come to a company, I just still don't feel comfortable. Are you emerging that I'm working here for my rest of my life? No way, right? So they will leave, right? So that's why you actually have to set up a environment and that's part of the corporate system, right? for a certain set of people. And just like the people that are paying games, right? They pay games until 2 a.m. in the morning and didn't give them in, uh, enough money, right? And if they go work for a company that, you know, say, hey, no, you know, I know you pay games in college, you begin, but when you come to here, you cannot touch it at all, right? And if other companies that say, hey, we got a lot of games here, you want to come here and pay, right? They, they will go work for those companies, right? So essentially the environment is set up and, and, and to attract certain set of people. So now for individuals, right, for young people, they need to understand what they want and they need to understand if that environment fits them, right? Different companies have different type of settings, okay? And Google is different, right, than, than compared to Intel and then HP, right? Every, everything is different. And it's that's the fit that we do. They fit their personality essentially, right? And then those kind of people that they attract eventually collectively get to a culture. And also by doing certain projects like, you know, Google putting all this, um, 
you know, projects in the environment and all those things, right? Kind of creating a, you know, in, promoting that kind of culture, right? And once you're promoting that kind of culture and attracting those people that are, have a, a, a desire for mastery, right? You attract those artists and people, right? Then eventually you gain the ability, right? And you force the learning on them too as well and get the, you know, get those things and eventually get to innovation. So I wouldn't say, you know, one thing is important than the others, right? It, it, you know, the wheel is actually important, but for a person to be willing to work for this company, you have to provide certain things, uh, you know, to make sure that they're comfortable, right? And that's actually the cultural and, and the environmental perspective. Okay, um, hopefully I answered your you. question. Yes, you did, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. I didn't catch that. It's a little bit hard to hear. Any more questions? Any more questions? Are we done? Hello, how are you done?
היי. אוקיי, אני לא מספיק אנגלית מאוד טוב, אבל אוקיי. Are there some place where I can find information? Yes, so, um, you know, the good way is actually go to Amazon, where I uh, searched for my name, and then the book is there, and also have some descriptions there. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, for getting into details, right, there's only one way to do it. It's actually getting the book, right? Uh, or you can actually also take the class that I offer in, in Stanford, which uh, offers LV Spring. Uh, spring is starting from April to, you know, uh, uh, June sometime, yeah. Okay, thank you. And also for those of you that uh, um, there's a Bastille, a magazine that actually translating some of the things into a magazine. Uh, so it's actually in uh, Portuguese that they actually did a summary. So for those who just, um, you know, not English, they can do that as well. And then also... Um, magazine in Brazil, you said? Yeah. That we can... Yeah, so just search for it. I think they just come out like two months, uh, two months ago. And then for those that are Chinese, also the Tsinghua Review um, also have an article that talk about this. But again, those are very high level things, right? Uh, unless you read the book, uh, you're not going to get the most of those, those uh, practices. Is that a Kindle version of your book? Yes, the... yes, yes. There's a electronic, but like I mentioned, right, the electronic portion of it, you can only read the content, and, and you do not get the concept that I put out there if you want to read uh, jumping uh, from session to session, right? If you if you want to read the whole book, you know, in, in you know, from top to bottom uh, without jumping around, which is fine, right? So you can you can get the Kindle. Uh, the Kindle is, I think, is thirty nine ninety nine, and the the full price for the whole book is forty nine ninety five. I think so. It's not much a difference. And and the reason uh, actually the book is I have to paint it in color because I have a lot of, of uh, actually have over one hundred eighty uh, illustrations and you know to show how to do things. So and a lot of them are in color. So. Oh. Thank you. It's just because it's easier and faster to get in the Kindle first, and yeah, then we can okay get as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, hey. Yes. Will there be another webinar session today? Uh, I'm doing only doing this one one time, so I'm not sure. This I don't think this is a question for me, but yeah. All right. Any questions?
Any more questions? No, Ken, thank you. The only yeah. problem is that it's showing that Amazon that is shipping from two to five weeks. So uh, oh. I probably need the Kindle version at this point. So congratulations. Okay. Yeah. Probably oh, a lot of people you. buying it. All right, thank you. Yes. So if you have any questions, that's where you feel free to contact me as well. Um, you know, and, and the uh and, and the book actually have my email address as well. So All right, I guess we're closing the session. So goodbye, everybody. Bye, thank you very much. Yeah, goodbye.